Just say one here this morning. Isn't it good to be a Christian? Amen. Amen. Response time. Response time, especially in emergencies, is very important. Uh, oftentimes they do statistical analysis of trying to find out what is the average response time of EMS or a fire department or a police department. Back in 1989, uh, there was over 150,000 uh, cases where the police were asked to respond and the average response time was about an hour. Uh, now they say the average response time is about, some stuff you read says 11 minutes across the board, some say 10. You've got some places like uh, in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, I think the response time is about nine minutes. Dallas is actually pretty fast about responding. And you know, there's all kinds of things involved, but we know how important it is in a case of an emergency for there to be a quick response. I was at a preacher's lunch in Angleton the other day and uh, the preacher started talking about just these situations where uh, emergencies may happen in the church and how to expedite the response time. And, and now I guess they have little, their little phones that you can buy at Walmart, uh, put them, mount them different places in the building. And if somebody came in uh, the building, whether it was a, a violent thing or whether someone had a medical emergency, you could actually just take those phones and you hit the button and it takes you straight to 911. And even though you might not hear you should be able to hear them, but if you don't, they can hear what's going on and they'll respond immediately, regardless, uh, once you place that. So that. And so a lot of churches are starting to, to, to do that. I didn't bring that up because I feel like we need it, but necessarily, but uh, not a bad idea because we know how important that is. If you don't have a phone or you can't respond or you're, you're trying to get your cell phone or the battery's dead or lots of different things happen, that's another way to ensure that there's a quick response because when you're in a situation where it's life and death, seconds and minutes can make a big difference. We know how important response time is. When uh, young people uh, order their, you know, I was watching on the news the other day, now they're having, they have uh, drones that are making deliveries. Some can go to, like private islands uh, and deliver like an EpiPen or something real important. And then they did a whole deal about they have these drones that will deliver burritos to college students, you know. So they're, they're talking about the delivery time and uh, things that really make a big difference. And then they're talking about the, the importance of uh, the delivery time of a, some burritos at a college. Uh, campus, I think you're going to do it with pizza and different things like that. So it's kind of fascinating when you think about what's being done. But I was sitting there thinking, that's kind of silly. Burritos, really? It's, you know, th this over here is really important. And then I got to thinking, how important is that response time to me? If you go to a restaurant and you ask, how much time is it going to be before I get seated? And they tell you 10 minutes, you want that response time to be accurate, right? An hour later, you don't want to be still waiting, do you? And if you order a pizza, you know, there are some times around here where you can order one. You could get it in 20 minutes or you could get it in, I was going to say two days, but that's not true. <laughs> Maybe you could be waiting an hour or longer because if they only have so many people working. Lots of things factor in to how we respond. Sometimes you get someone to respond to you and they don't. We raise children, sometimes they respond, sometimes they don't. Responding. In relationships, response is important. In matters of life and death, response is important. And in our relationship with God, our response, our response time to God is important. How do we respond? In fact, we read stories in the Bible about people, whether it's Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way through to New Testament people like Paul and Aquila and Priscilla. How did they respond to God? 
How did Daniel respond to God? How did Esther respond to God? As Mordecai told her, you know, uh, you know, maybe God's put you in the kingdom for such a time as this. You know, there there are stories about people who are going to respond. And Jesus comes on the scene. And one of the things that John highlights in his gospel are these encounters that Jesus has with people. Whether it's the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, whether it's Nicodemus, whether it's the beloved John, uh, the writer of the book. These encounters that Jesus has and how the response was. And one question for us is, what is my response time to God? To God's message? When God places His message in my heart, how do I respond? Do I respond the right way or the wrong way? And really, it's one of those critical teachings that Jesus makes about the parable of the sowers that talks about the heart and how it's going to respond. So this morning, I want us to think about that for a minute. And when I remember when I was a kid, there was a writer at the time. His name was Philip Keller. He wrote several different books. My dad and I read several of those books together. One was A Good Gardener Looks at the Parable of the Sower. Uh, another book was A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. And, and they're written in kind of devotional format. He's talk, he takes his experience of being a shepherd with sheep and parallels it with that relationship. Well, one of the books he wrote was about, I, I don't know if it was, it, I think it was, a, it was kind of a smaller book with an audio tape. I remember uh, with a cassette tape. Remember what those are? The good old days. Whatever happened? Eight tracks, cassette tapes? They've all gone by the wayside. Anyway, um, it, it was about the potter and the clay. And the experience of molding and shaping clay in this visual illustration we get in the Old Testament about God being the potter and us uh, being the clay. God works in our lives. In the book of Philippians it says, He's at work in you to will and to act according to His purpose. God is working on me. God is working on you, trying to shape you and mold you to become the kind of person He wants you to be. And it says if we're led by the Spirit, you can step with the Spirit. So we see that we see it clearly pictured in the Bible that God is working in us. God is at work to do things, both through His Word and providentially God is shaping our lives so that we will be with Him. We see that very clearly in the Old Testament when we, we read the story of Joseph. Joseph, one of the brothers, He's got a bunch of brothers. They're jealous of him. They fake his death. They throw him in a well. They sell him into slavery. He goes off to Egypt. He gets in Potiphar's house. His wife tries to seduce Joseph. Joseph flees. He's put in prison. There's a butler and there's a baker and there's the stories. And time goes on and on and on. And who was supposed to remember him? Seemed like he forgot about him. But then he brings him up because he knew he could interpret the dream. And he becomes someone who at the final end of the story will say, what you meant for my harm, God used that for good. And we see this story of God just providentially working things out in his life. And we have passages that say things like, God can work anything for good, for those who love Him have been called according to His purpose. And it gives us hope that even when we face the bad circumstances in life, God can work that out for good, for those who love Him and been called according to His purpose. And He does that providentially, doesn't He? Isn't it amazing sometimes how things just fall into place? God is at work to will and act according to His purpose. He's shaping our lives. But in the Old Testament, God's communicating His relationship with Israel. And in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, He says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And so there's this picture of God with Israel shaping and molding and trying to influence them. And then in Jeremiah, we have this parable. And part of it is 
This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house and there you, I will give you my message. So he's saying, I'm going to give you a message to send, but I'm going to give it to you in a picture. I'm going to give it to you in an experience. I want you to see something because a picture is worth a thousand words, right? It's going to, he's going to have an encounter that's going to transform his thinking about God and his relationship with Israel. And it says, so I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the will. But the pot he was chafing from the clay was marred in his hands. And so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it to be what seemed best to him. So here's the picture. Here's the potter at the wheel. He's spinning the table around, the wheel around, and he's trying to shape this pot. But the pot has a mar in it. It has something that is kind of sticking out. It's not forming the way it should. And so he stops the wheel. He tries to, if you watch potters do this, they'll try to slick it up and get it, get rid of that mar and start spinning it around. And if it mars again and again, pretty soon they just smash the whole thing down and start all over again. And so you've got this picture. God is trying to shape Israel in the way they're supposed to go, but there's a flaw. What is it? It's their sin. It's their pride. It's their selfishness. It's their whatever it is. Their indulgence, uh, and they're not doing what they're not going where God wants them to go. They're marred, and so God has to shake them into something else. And it's a pretty stagger. And then He goes on in the past and explains some stuff about what He's fixing to do to them because they're not conforming. They're not like clay. And we sing some songs that kind of I surrender. I surrender all. If you really say those words and take those words to heart as you sing them, that's a hard song to sing. Surrender all. Because most of us are hanging on to something. We haven't totally let go of everything. And so we see this picture of God shaping and forming someone's life, but He's not getting the response that He was after. Then the word of the Lord came to me and said, can I not do uh, with you, Israel, as the potter does, declares the Lord, like the clay in the hand of the potter, so you are in my hand. You're going to let me shape you, or I'm going to crush you and, and make something else out of you. And we know the history, right? We know about Babylon, Babylonian captivity. We know about the judgments of the Lord. We know what they went through to, for him to get to a point. We know the heartache and heartbreak God went through with Israel to get them to a point. But they kept on doing their own thing and they wouldn't respond to God in the right amount of time. And when you don't do that, things happen. And in our lives, it's no different. When we keep on pulling away from God, at a certain point, He's going to let us go. And we're going to fall into our sin and we're going to wake up with our head spinning, empty, not knowing where things are. And we're going to have to put the pieces of our lives back together. And just like the prodigal son, I mean, the father was shaping his life and he said, give me my inheritance, I'm going to go do my thing and spend his money while living. But he had a bunch of fair weather friends. When the money was gone, the friends were gone. He finds himself in a pig pen, longing to eat the pig stuff, the pods that the pigs were eating. And it says that he came to his senses and he, got, he went back to God. And what did God, what was the picture? God ran, put a coat on him, feet on, uh, shoes on his feet, rings on his fingers, killed the fatted calf. God brought him back, but he had to come home so that God could mold him and shape him the way that God needed to. Well, in the New Testament, we have a, a, a story about someone who responded to God in the right way. The story is about Lydia. On the Sabbath day, they went outside the city gate to the river and were expected to find a place to pray. So on the Sabbath, People usually went to the synagogue, but there was none. And to have church as a Jew, you had to have 10 people. 
So people would often go to places like a river or a park or places to gather. And so they go down and they sat down and began to speak to the woman who had, uh, women who had gathered there. And one of those listening was from the city of Thyatira. Her name was Lydia. Lydia was a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. She wasn't a Jew. She was a Gentile that was believing in God seeking God, looking to Him as the one and only God. And it says that she, she listens and then the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And when she and the members of her house were baptized, she invited us in, to her home. If you consider me a believer uh, in the Lord, she said, come and stay with me in my house. And they persuaded us. And then you have some other conversions after this, the Philippian jailer. And it's kind of, a, just take some time this week maybe to reach Acts chapter 16 with this theme in mind of responding to the message of God. Because her response was she listened, she received, and she obeyed. Pretty simple, isn't it? I've studied the Bible, studied Hebrew, studied Greek. I read it all the time, but it's amazing to me as much as I've read it, you know, every once in a while I'll just be reading something and it'll just hit me in a way that it's never hit me before. And sometimes it, it, it takes on a very personal nature with me. This is one of those passages because it gets back to that simple, basic truth. It's me. It's about me and God. And how am I responding to God? Am I listening to Him? Am I receiving what He's sending me? I mean, I communicate a lot of times to people the message and they don't receive it. I can tell. Half the time they can't remember what I told them, right? Maybe that's my fault. But sometimes later in their lives, I see things happen and I think they didn't ever get it. They didn't get it. They, didn't, they weren't picking up what I was laying down. They, they might have heard it, but they didn't receive it. They didn't get it. And I know the difference between hearing something. All the time as I was growing up, my mom, you know, are you, you know, did you hear me? Are you listening to me? You know, yeah, I heard you. No, you're not listening to me. You didn't listen to me. You've done what I said. You heard that before, right? I've been accused by others in my life that I'm not listening to. But anyway. <laughs> um, but she listened, she received, and she obeyed. So I want us to think about these see, three, this, this, this little simple story because it, it's, it's very powerful when you think about it and when you try to apply it to your life as a disciple. First of all, we just need to listen to God's Word. Whether it's from this book, whether it's music that communicates the message of God's Word, whether, whether, whether it's a Christian-based uh, program, whatever it, whatever it is, things that communicate things about the Gospel, but especially His Word. There's no substitute for it. You, you have to spend time in God's Word, reading it, studying it, listening to it, but even the way you listen to sermons, are you listening? And what kind of things help you listen? Some people listen. They, I see people out there right now taking notes, writing stuff down. When I see that, guess what message that sends to my head? They're paying attention. They're listening, right? Because they're writing stuff down. Sometimes the girls up here will show me after services, you know, that they will write down the points that I made. People will come up to me and ask me, what is that message? What is that sending to me? That message is sending... They're paying attention. They're listening. Our, our hearts have to be exposed to the message. That's the only way we're going to grow. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. You want to have strong faith? You have to get the message. You have to listen to the message. You know, now, now we have Sunday evening services are on. Uh, and not all of you come back. So Sunday evening services are on audio tape. Sunday morning sermons are on YouTube. There's ways to get the message, right? Whatever that is. But are you listening? And there's a difference between hearing something, I'm told, and listening. 
right? And you know if you're listening to God or not. And even as a preacher, even as an elder, it makes you pause and reflect a little bit when you just stand there and think, looking in the mirror and saying, am I really listening to God? And I can think of some areas of my life where I'm not paying attention. I'm not really listening to what God is telling me to do. Or I would change my behavior, right? I would change the way I'm operating with something. And sometimes I have good intentions as a father, as a husband, as a preacher, as an elder. It's not about good intentions, right? It's about delivery. It's about making changes. It's about really listening to where God is wanting me to go in the direction and, and take it that, that way. Jesus often said, he who has ears, let him hear. We see that in Revelation 2 in the letters to the seven churches. He who has ear, let him hear. You got an ear. Listen up. A voice came out of the cloud on the Mount of Transfiguration. And God is speaking and he says, this is my son. Whom I love. My chosen one. He could have said anything he wanted to say. What did he say? Listen to him. Listen to him. Pay attention. He who has ears, let him hear. Whose voices are you listening to? And that's the problem, isn't it? We spend a lot of our time listening to the media, listening to entertainment, listening to the radio, listening to movies or things of that nature that influence our minds. And sometimes those things are not giving us the message that God would want us to have. Who are you listening to? Do you listen to things that inspire you, build you up? I mean, we're told specifically, think about what is noble, about what is right, what is good, what is excellent. When you really listen to the world, that's not the stuff you're getting. You're not getting noble, excellent. You're getting other stuff, right? Whose voice are you listening to? Jesus said, his sheep hear his voice. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I mean, think about just simply what is the definition of a disciple? Listen to Jesus and follow him. Listen to him and do what he says. Do you hear him? In Revelation 14, it says, There are those who didn't defile themselves with a woman, they follow the Lamb wherever. He went. Are you following the Lamb wherever He's leading you? Are you listening to His voice or do you listen to other voices? The second thing is receive it. It says, her, the Lord opened her heart to the message. The message is given. Your heart has to receive it. In Acts chapter 17, we're going to get a slide in a minute, so I'll say it again. Um, first time I've ever done that. Um, the Bereans were of more noble character because they received the word with readiness and they searched the scriptures diligently to make sure what they were being taught was true. They, were served, they, they received the word with readiness. I'm up here preaching. You're at home at night. 11.30 at night. 5 a.m. in the morning. Whenever you read your Bible. I, I know it's sometime, right? Um, are you ready to receive what God's about to say? How many times before you read your Bible do you pause and just say, God, I, I want my heart to receive the message of your word. You ever pray that prayer? Try that. See what God does. See what happens. The seed is sown. And we have our hearts have to respond to the message. Jesus talked about sowing spiritual seed. He said a sower went out to sow the seed and he sowed the seed and it fell. He uses a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning to illustrate it. Then he interprets it 
And he says, the seed goes on pathy ground, it goes on rocky ground, it goes on weedy ground, and it goes on good ground. And when it goes on the pathy ground, the, the seed is the word, the devil comes and just takes it right up. When he goes in the rocky ground, it doesn't have any root, it spurts up, it looks good. We know people who hear the message of the gospel, they get excited, everything's exciting, there's growth taking place, but it doesn't last because there's no root. They shrivel up and die. And some of the seed gets in the weedy ground and it grows up in the wealth and the riches of this life, choke out the word. But some gets on the good soil and it produces good things. What kind of heart do we have? And the reality for me is I got different places in my heart that are made up of different types of soil. I got some rocky ground. I got some stony ground. I got some good, lots of good ground. And some weedy ground. And what do you do if the ground is not what you want it to be in your garden? You take up the path. You get rid of the rocks. You get rid of the weeds and you cultivate it. The same guy, Philip Keller, who wrote the book and did the audio cassette thing about the potter looking at the clay, wrote a book called The Good Gardener Looks at the Parable of the Sower. And it's a powerful little book I remember reading with my dad. It's a guy way back, I mean, this is back in the 80s. Uh, yeah, probably even the 70s when I was, was reading these books with my dad. Um, the good old days, bell bottoms, right? Um, cultivating good soil. How do you do that? You pray, you work on your attitude. Your attitude in worship should be something that takes place on Saturday, not Sunday morning when you're driving to the church. It's something that you prepare for. It's about attitude. I, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I remember preachers, and I remember when I was in Huntsville, we had the preacher from the A and M Church of Christ come over and uh, speak one time, and I remember him getting up, and, and one of the, the first little thing he talked about was that Sunday is the most important day of the week. Sunday is my favorite day. Sunday is the most significant day in my life because I'm a Christian. And I remember growing up with, with that kind of sentiment. The most important day is Sunday. The most important thing you can do is be prepared for Sunday. You go to, you, you know, we go to bed early for school. We make sure we got a lot of rest before we go to school, but we stay out super late on Saturday. Is Jesus worth it? Is it the most important day to you? I don't know about you, but I want Jacob and Andrew and all the kids growing up, Nico and Abby and everyone in this congregation growing up with an attitude that says Sunday's the most important day because that's when God's people meet. That's when we celebrate the supper. That, that's, a, that's cultivating my heart. That's shaping me into a person that what is the most important thing? It's God's Word. That's the most important thing in my life. When I was a teenager, if you asked me if everything in your house was burning and you could go back for one thing, what would you get? I would say a Bible. I wouldn't have said that when I was 14 or 15. But when I was 16 and 17, that was the most important thing to me because it's the thing that changed me. When nothing else could change me, when nothing else made sense, when nothing else gave me hope, this is where I found it. Do you live like this is the most important thing? Or do you live like this is the most important thing? Do you live like your bank account or your job is the most important thing? Do you live like this is the most important thing? The way people drive... And the way people act in restaurants and grocery stores, I would think this is the most important thing in the world. <clears throat> is it? Jesus says, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world, yet you forfeit your soul? Now the Bereans were a more noble character because they received the word with readiness. 
they were ready to receive it. And when it is put on good soil, God will produce amazing things in our lives if we have a cultivated heart. And then the final thing is obey it. The story is simple. Jesus said, the person who hears the word and puts it into practice like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He went down to the bedrock. He built it. The floods came. And his house stood firm. But the foolish man built his house on the sand. And the rains came. And the waters rose. And his house, his house the, the children's song says, went splat. To me, this is a beautiful teaching of Jesus because he's telling me, Russell, you want your life to be strong? Listen and obey. Simply obey what I say. Huh. The Jews are coming to Jericho. March around it seven times. On the seventh day, seven times. Blow the trumpets, the walls will fall down. That wasn't very strategic. But they simply obeyed God and the walls fell down. Those are things that my heart hangs on to as a Christian because I believe if I'll simply obey God, it's all going to work out. And it always does. And Jesus is saying, you want your life to be strong? Do you want it to have stability when the things in life come at you and crumble you? Do you see people who go through suffering and their faith slips away from them? Do you see... There used to be a book that Lynn, I think Lynn Anderson, I think I'm correct here, wrote it called Fallen Shepherds Scattered Sheep. What's the picture there? Elders who fall away, who mess up, who make mistakes, they fall. Preachers make mistakes. And when, when they fall, the sheep scatter. That's the picture. I want to have a life that when whoever falls, I stay stable. I stay steady in the boat. I want to have a faith that sustains me no matter what happens. I want to be a Job in the midst of all the trials. I want to see it through. How do you do that? Jesus says, listen and obey. That's where you'll find it. It's all about yielding to God, letting God have his way in my life. He's the potter. I'm the clay. Am I letting God have his way? And then in Psalm 1, he says, but those who delight in the law of the Lord, uh, who meditate on it day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water. That's what I want my life to be like. I want it to be strong. I want it to be fruitful. I want it to be productive. How does that happen? Listen, receive, and obey. Maybe you're here today and you're at that point in your life where you listen to the gospel message that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that you need to believe in Him, <coughs> repent of your sin, confess His name and His Lordship, and be baptized into Christ. The gospel is simple. If you're ready to give your life to Jesus and live for Him and not for yourself, don't wait any longer to take that step. Hear it, receive it, obey it as we stand and sing.